the questions that people have when it comes particularly to economics, though. I also think that it's sometimes useful to know the background of the person that's speaking to you. And um, as such, I do have a background in supply chain and a passing interest in, in politics and history and, um, and economics. So that's where I'm kind of coming from. I should also be upfront about my maybe political biases here because there is a lot of politics involved when we start talking about political systems and economic systems. Um, I sometimes refer to myself as a radical moderate, which essentially means that if we have a long conversation, I'll say lots of things you don't agree with, and a few things that you do, because I, I fit kind of squarely in the middle of the political spectrum, though I'm also open to unusual and extreme ideas. So that's where I'm kind of coming from. So I, I do acknowledge that bias, so that when I analyze things and talk about them, I try to be as unbiased as possible, but you know, that's not entirely possible. We always bring with us our own past history and experience. So that's who I am, and um, and I think we'll jump right in because we have a lot to talk about now. Hmm. Maybe it's like the slide advance is not working. Go ahead, advance the slide for me. Maybe it'll start oh, working good. again. There we go. Oh, all right. So um, I recognize that this is this. Presentation is really titled industrial policy, but I think that we should take just a few minutes to talk a little about what's happening um, on the world stage. I do know that four weeks ago, um, you had a lecture on Russia, um, which I think has become kind of interesting based on the events of the past week. So the first thing I wanna talk about is actually Ukraine. I think that's on everyone's mind. I know as I was driving in this morning, I was listening to uh, public radio and they were interviewing uh, a journalist who's in Kiev um, about what was happening there. So that's on everyone's mind. So we'll start by talking a little bit about the Ukraine. Uh, Gain a lot of economic power, and is it good when everybody um, is more prosperous, or maybe not? And that's a really interesting question um, that, that I think is the focus of the article and really the focus of um, the decisions that we make as a people and as a government. So we'll talk about that first, then we'll jump kind of straight into the article. I use the article to kind of format some slides. I think we'll go relatively quickly. My intention is to spend the next 30 to 40 minutes up here kind of talking uh, with uh, Professor Vanderhart and then um, open it up for questions because I expect there'll be a few questions. Was trying to cut and paste something from CNN and couldn't get it to work. Um, can you can you go a little closer to the mic? I'm sorry, they can't hear you online. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yeah. so much better. better. Sorry. Um, so this picture just shows NATO membership in Europe. Now, the light blue countries were the founding members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And then the only other country to join before the Berlin Wall came down was Spain in 1982, I believe. Um, the rest of those countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, um, all joined in the 2000s, actually. So that gives a picture of NATO membership and explains in, in a little bit, and of course, Ukraine is right here. 
This is the edge of Ukraine, that's Belarus. Um, maybe why Russia feels a little bit hemmed in to some extent, but it's also notable that they all chose to join <laughs> um, more than 10 years after the supposed breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and I think that many of them are viewing that now as a really good choice based on, on events of this week. Go to, go to the next slide. This, this next slide is a, is a picture of what happened in 2014. There we go. When Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula, which is a dark red down below, there were um, uprisings of pro-Russian separatists that captured government buildings in those three provinces that are there to the east that are closer to Russia. I, I don't know this, but I speculate that one of the things we have happening in Ukraine is as you move east, you have progressively more Russians, like the, because this was all one country not that long ago, people moved around somewhat. There was some movement, we'll say. I don't want to say they moved freely, but there was the ability to do some moving. And so uh, it's more Russian there than it is as you move further east. Um, and so there's some people who would like to be part of Russia again. Now, at that time, there was a massing of troops along the border. This This is a CNN map showing where explosions were reported um, early that morning of the 24th Europe time. And then um, this map is the, the closest thing I could find to a current snapshot of the situation yesterday evening. I actually think it's pretty good. This is from Wikipedia. Um, the user who made it though is, is acknowledged in the, in the picture. But you can see how troops um, have penetrated into the into the country up from primary Crimea in the south. Um, those areas, most of the areas to the east, were already disputed territories in the control of uh, Russian military and Ukrainian separatists. Yeah. Oh, it's sorry. I I don't know if I lost them or not. Do you mind one second? I'm sorry. I can't find the zoom. Yeah, go ahead. Anyway, and then from the north, you can see where troops have invaded um, from Russia and from Belarus. Um, and that main thrust that's headed toward the city of Kyiv from the in Russia, well, 12, and then another permanent base that's Moldova there to the south, just immediately to the east of the city of Odessa. Uh, but there'd been major troop buildup over the last few months all around, and they now have moved into Ukraine. So that's where we're at. And what we can see is that it's, in some ways, it's an exercise of the type of political power for a long time, but in, in the article that we read, we talked a lot about it, talked a lot about China, and that's one of the things that you see is that China's military has built up, they've modernized, and that's exactly the type of thing that can happen when a country becomes more prosperous economically. And um, that kind of gets us to the, uh, well, speaking of China, I thought this was interesting. This is a, an article that appeared yesterday on CNN, and um, Essentially, the Chinese are blaming the United States for the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. Um, 
basically saying that we fanned the flames with, with rhetoric that forced the Russians to invade. Um, but it's interesting. I think this is very telling. The bottom in the article is this little snippet that I think is kind of interesting and wonderful. A glimpse of the kind of guidance that state media may be under emerged Tuesday when what appeared to be an Here a little bit. Um, one of the things that makes the United States, for all of its flaws, truly great is, I think, our ability to have open and free discourse. Even if we don't care for what the government does or we don't agree with its policy. filtered and limited, so it's sometimes really hard to get an accurate snapshot of what people feel and, and what they think. Um, I'm going to move on from that to talk, kind of review some things from the article. So at the very beginning, the author talks about the fact that there have been three attempts, um, in his view, um, of implementing some sort of industrial policy in the United States. Um, I probably believe it's probably more like three recent attempts because I think there's more historically if you go back further. I remember some from my, you know, high school AP European and American history classes, but I went ahead and went with the article. Um, he noted in the late 70s, early 80s, in the late 90s, and then after 20, 2008, there were attempts to start to implement some sort of industrial policy or controls or aids on the growth of industry and noted that in the first two, the results were actually the opposite. <laughs> Rather than passing legislation that helped industries, a legislation ended up being passed that created uh, less control and less regulation on industries. Um, again, I'm not an expert in this area, but I know in the early 80s what happened was that there was a lot of deregulation of financial institutions. Prior to then, you, you couldn't be, say, an investment bank and also sell stock because then you have conflicting fiduciary since the early 1980s. So things kind of went the other way. And I think that that's probably true. Um, however, in 2008, there were some things, the Frank Dodd Act regulating some financial transactions came into play, as well as the Affordable Care Act were um, kind of listed. Now, the question is what happens in 2022? Um, now there, and really this goes all the way back to probably the election in 2020, because um, the Biden administration, even when he was running for office, you know, I don't think anyone is surprised at what they've tried to do, right? They said they were going to try to do certain things and they came into power and they've tried to do those things. Uh, some things successfully, many things not successfully yet, um, but it's a different environment, but it represents something of a shift in the prevailing notion of what the, the type of control the government should have economically. And, uh, myself what, what, what they're even talking about and uh, um, I think I kind of know but what I asked him to come so one of the things that you know I, I think that a really big question here well, the questions here on the right are the questions that were raised in the article and some of them I think are a bit of an overreach I'm not sure this discussion is really necessarily about 
trust or mistrust of government or government. States and, and toward Taiwan, I don't think has really changed all that much, but now there's maybe more to back it up than there used to be, if that makes sense. And then we, I didn't put any slides in on this, but we could certainly have a conversation about what's happened in Hong Kong over the last two years um, as, as uh, things have shifted there. I, I, have a, I have a colleague at the university who is from Hong Kong, but she doesn't claim it as home anymore. She now considers herself to be from Taiwan um, because of what's what's happened in the past two years there. So China is starting to flex its muscle, um, and they've used the economic prosperity that they've derived by trading with the world. Their primary trading partner is the United States. So we have aided them and abetted them in their growth. And it leads to some interesting questions about economic theory. So I made a slide that you probably can't read, <laughs> where, which is okay, where it talks about these different types of economics, classical, neoclassical, liberal, neoliberal, and I'm going to throw Austrian economics on there as well, that kind of all in some flavor or nuance advocate for little government control and interaction in, in what's happening in the economy. Um, and, and certainly not much industrial policy. Um, and you kind of let things go. The Austrian school in particular, I find very interesting. Um, I'm not sure I completely agree with it, but I do find it interesting in that they, they claim that the, the cyclical nature of economics is just part of the process. And, and what emerges is maybe better at the end of those cycles than what you had before. And if you try to actually intervene, you just make things worse. Um, what's really ironic is I actually teach that in my classes when it comes to manufacturing processes. There's something called control charts that help us distinguish whether the variation we're seeing is just a natural part of the process or whether it has some cause that we can maybe eliminate. And the theory there is that if it has a cause that we can identify, then you intervene. If it doesn't, it's just part of the natural fluctuations, then you shouldn't do anything. You should just let it go. And any attempt that you make to control it is actually labeled as tampering. And it can be shown mathematically that it just increases the variability. And as I see, that's essentially the same thing the Austrian economists, economists are saying. I see them as kind of on the extreme end um, for me in some ways of, of taking a step back. And then on the other side, you have more control. You go all, all the way to socialist policies where they try to control many things, um, if not everything. And then there's other shades of gray of that. Um, I found a website, something called human politics that tries to put a human element into it. I don't think that's really a thing, but I, I thought it was interesting. So I threw a few points up. And maybe set up as well why when we start talking about industrial policy it's really an economic discussion that has to do with all this theory that's been carefully thought about for a couple hundred years in many cases so. well i'm i'm not going to correct anything because he didn't do anything wrong oh that's good <laughs> <laughs> um i i will say uh, i'll start with an anecdote that relates back to his uh, map of ukraine um, I, I was the graduate director in economics 15, 20 years ago, and um, we recruited two grad students from Ukraine. And I thought, well, isn't this nice? They're going to be buddies. They're going to they're going to be friends. They're both from the same country. They're halfway around the world. They'll have they'll have somebody to relate to. Turns out they hated each other because one was from Kiev, the area around Kiev, and the other was of Russian descent in the eastern part and it was amazing some one of them would say 
something totally innocuous in class. And the other one would say, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And they were just at each other's throats the, the whole time through our program. I'm surprised there wasn't violence, but, <laughs> but there really is some, uh, and, you know, and it, the, the other thing was we couldn't really tell them apart, right? They could tell each other apart, probably their last names told them where they were from, but they seem to act very similar to us. And it just goes to show you that these ethnic controversies, um, they run deep. And I would argue they're a little silly too. But anyway, um, to get on with the, the topic at hand, I think it's very confusing to a lot of people um, about this term liberal. Um, so to philosophers and economists, liberal, the traditional meaning of liberal is very Adam Smith, very free market, um, very, no, you shouldn't be a mercantilist. You shouldn't manipulate your trade. You should just let the market decide what's what. And in American politics of the 80s or 90s, liberal meant, no, you should interfere with the market. It doesn't work well. Um, it's the opposite of conservative. And so it, it, when people say that word, it means different things to different people. But for the context of this paper, it really means the sort of the free market notion of um, what a good way to run an economy is. And in particular, the neoliberals, I think, emphasize that free trade with other countries is a very good idea. Um, we can't do anything in the United States, right? If, if we tried to produce everything for the world, we, we'd make a whole lot of money, but we wouldn't do it very well because we simply don't have all the resources of the world. So why not let countries specialize and then trade with them? So Mexico's great at making avocados and Canada's great at making maple syrup and maybe we're great at making wheat. Canada's also good at making wheat, but anyway, and everybody can do what they're good at and then trade amongst themselves. And I think that's, you probably heard of NAFTA, the agreement between those three countries. And I think that works very well. I think when your trading partners are like-minded, that they're generally peaceful. Um, I would argue probably Canada and Mexico might be more peaceful than us, right? But generally peaceful, respect borders, respect property rights. Um, when, you're, when you're sort of of the same mind like that, I think free trade is great. And that was the goal, I think, of neoliberalism, that we'll just trade with the whole world and everybody will be better off because of it. And even here that um, our trade opening with China was a strategy to get them to behave more like Canada and Mexico and, and the United States. And I think recent history has proven that maybe that didn't work out the way we thought it would. Um, certainly China liberalized um, economically. They have something that looks a little bit like free enterprise. Um, I won't call it capitalism because the Communist Party runs the country, but um, it looks a little more like free enterprise. You, you get to choose what you buy. You get to choose to some extent where you work. Um, but they have been very, as, as, your, as the article puts it, um, mercantilists. They have produced a lot and sold it to other countries, um, but they don't really let their consumer sector buy from other countries. And so they acquire a lot of, um, I guess I'd say investment money and foreign debt. Um, they're, you know, we, we go into debt and they're the ones that buy a lot of it. A lot of it's in the social security system and, and other domestic places, but certainly China um, buys a lot of foreign debt. Now, 
you know, why, why do they do that? Well, it's for the economic power that gives them some political power. They're able to afford more military that way. Um, they're able, able to be a bigger player on the world stage, but it does come at the expense of their consumers, right? Their consumers don't get to buy Cadillacs the way we do, right? Cadillacs are way more expensive. They have to buy Chinese cars instead, right? And they might need not even know what they're missing. Um, but, and so I don't think mercantilism, which seems to have worked great for China, I don't think it would work for us. We would just say, hey, why are, why are chairs so expensive? Well, it's because we don't import them from Vietnam anymore, right? And we would get very irate about that. And ultimately, I think the goal of a good government would be the, the beneficial aspects that accrue to the, to the citizens. And I think we do a pretty good job of that. It's like Bill says, I, I agree we're not perfect. Um, but I wouldn't suggest we undertake strategies like China and Russia that um, tend to distort that neoliberal thing, uh, thinking. Now, that said, um, I'm not sure it's a good idea to have a neoliberal attitude with a country that doesn't share your beliefs about how the world should be, how you should treat your citizens. And so I used to be a complete free trade sort of guy. I thought, you know, that's going to ultimately benefit the consumers. That's what we're after. Um, so let's do it. And I've come around to thinking that, you know, it's, it's great to trade with like-minded countries, but maybe not ones that are, that have, I'll say nasty ambitions, um, and I'll leave it there. Um, that's about all I... So, so I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> we didn't rehearse this, obviously. No. Uh, well, 15 minutes uh, near my office yesterday. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so um, maybe comment on, on what happens. Well, I think one of the theories, as I understand it, of neoliberalism, one of the pillars, is this idea that as we trade, we're actually really helping the citizens of the country and helping them to be brought up. And what you just said about mercantilism is that that may not be the case because the government may be holding some of it back to use for their own purposes. Right. In the case of China, the fact that they never really opened up to US companies to sell things. Um, and so the question is then, in an instance like that, would that be the type of thing that might send a signal that maybe this country doesn't have the best interest of its people in mind? Is, or is that a leap? Um, I, I, they might be um, certain times in history where countries have been mercantilist. I would say they had a misguided view of what would be good for their citizens. Mm -hmm. So if you look to the original European countries that um, uh, way back, boy, my history is going to be seventeen hundred. Is seventeen hundreds where um, they sort of passed laws that encouraged domestic production of things that other nearby countries really did better, and they would do that for the employment of their of the people in their country, and um, and certainly those people. If I, keep thinking the corn laws. And I, I can't remember who was exporting and importing corn, but um, they would- Well, even the Stamp Act that affected the United States right before the revolution. That's right. Was about, that was about paper. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you're supporting domestic workers, a particular subset of domestic workers, and certainly they're happy, but the things you're not importing they, and this is a counterfactual, right? You don't observe this not happening. <laughs> I think I have too many knots in there, but anyway, um, the rest of the people not in the subset are just a smidgen worse off because you're not trading externally. And it's maybe such a small smidgen that they don't notice it. 
Yeah. Right. And so it's, it's, it, it, I won't go as far as saying they don't have their best interests in mind. It might be they think they do, but they were misguided. Um, in the case of China, I think they know what they're doing. <laughs> and, um, and certainly the, the populace of China is way better off than it was 20 years ago, right? They enjoy many more consumer goods, um, but they could be even better. It's again, the counterfactual, right? They, maybe they're 150% more prosperous measured somehow, but they could have been 170% more, right? And so, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that answer. Yeah. Great, anything else you wanna add at this point? I can't think of anything. Okay. So we'll open it up for combined questions. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Is that your last slide? No, 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 I have a lot more. Oh, slides. okay. That's my last slide. Let's, let's, let's continue. Wait. We'll, we'll continue and then we'll come back. Any economics questions people take? Um, and actually anything else he wants to say too. You know, uh, listening to him talk and then thinking about this myself, you know, one of the interesting problems and I think a really interesting question is, you know, is it okay to make somebody's maybe consumption a little bit worse off to maybe help them keep their job for a while? You know, I, I, I wonder if, if when you, when a company, when a country, sorry, chooses to implement mercantilist policies or industrial policy, if maybe it should have like an expiration date or you put something in place that kind of gradually winds down over, you know, 10 years or something or 15 years or seven years so that it, it's in place, the protection's there, but it's a little bit less each year and it goes away so that you can soften the blow, you know? Because I, I think that jobs are kind of a big deal, um, you know? Okay. But it's interesting. I mean, it's a really interesting question. Well, let's go ahead and go on, but, but I think that I think it was good to take that aside to talk about economics and neoliberal economics because it's in a lot of the article because of these philosophies and, and particularly this idea that everybody becomes better off together when we trade. I mean, that's kind of at the core, the core moral argument for free trade is that we're all better off. And um, maybe we are, maybe we aren't. And I think I really like this idea that, that Pete kind of introduced to me as we were chatting yesterday that maybe it really depends on who the who the trading partner is. You know, if you're very like-minded, then free trade is probably great. Maybe as you're less like-minded, you maybe take more to look at it. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. And for some reason, I'm not working again. Here. All right. So th this kind of and this is just from the article. Do you want to give a question really quick? Yes, please. Could you go back to the last screen? Sure. Try. We can Maybe. <laughs> you want to try? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. But could you please make some comments on there on one to five questions? Yeah, so this, I, I debated even putting this up, but because this is just a, a blog post. The, the reference is there, Earthbound Report 2021. So it's a, a post from May. Where somebody talks about the idea of human politics and essentially these five points the first one says land and housing land ownership and you should create real value for people and communities including truly affordable housing number two is responsible business where you look at social and environmental values three banks should lend uh, money to things that benefit human outcomes over the accumulation of money assets public services um, should be seen as creators of value um, not cost to be reduced and economic outcomes. So GDP should prioritize, be reformed to prioritize human well being over resource depletion, environmental destruction, and asset price increases. I, I went ahead and put that there simply because I, I think that there's a lot of people that would like to see more of those things valued and measured in some way. Um, and, and I probably fit in that category too. I would love to see that. At the same time, it's really problematic. Um, because even when you talk about values, like it should value, what does the number two say? Companies should embrace social and environmental values. Well, whose social and environmental values? Mine? Yours? Chinese governments? I mean, they have their own 
environmental and social values. So this is problematic, but I do think that it's real, meaning there's a lot of people that would like to see more movement in this direction. But to do that, you're basically implementing your value system and laying it over the markets. And what, what an economist would say, I think, is that over time, the market will reflect the values of the society. So if, if we don't agree with what a bank is doing, for instance, then we won't support the bank. And over time, that bank will lose its clientele and that will direct the bank toward practices that are more in harmony with the values of the society. And I mean, is that fair? It is. Okay. There, there's a lot of informational problems. But there are a lot of informational problems. Well, and that gets down to the whole, the whole real problem here is one of um, time. So how long will that take before that bank is told to behave in the way we want, wherever we are? <laughs> and then number two is perfect information, right? Like, like, do we really know everything the bank's doing? Do we know who it's made loans to? Sometimes we, sometimes we know a lot of things are public. In the United States, lots is public. Um, in, in many countries, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, in the United States, we, we love freedom and we love good information to make decisions, but we also like privacy to some extent too. And so you're always straddling this line between privacy and information to make decisions. We actually are, I think, in my opinion, is we're pretty far to one side when it comes to privacy. And we have much less privacy here than many other, say, European countries do. A lot more privacy than, say, people in China do. So it's like a, it's like a, it's a, it's a balance. But that's the real issue with this type of thing, this whatever it is, human politics. But like I said, I found it interesting enough, I put it on the slide. I think it's interesting, I think it's a force, but I think it's problematic for a lot of reasons in terms of governance, but that's the whole idea. So, so in a free market that had perfect information, everybody knew everything, um, over time, organizations would be guided to make the kind of decisions that the people would like just based on who they choose to, to deal with. But that, it's pretty clear that takes a while. You know, so so we intervene as a government, we the government intervenes in order to speed up that process and or maybe to try to compensate for information problems, who knows what, or maybe value issues. You know, one of the one of the roles of government is actually to protect the rights of minorities. And I'm not talking necessarily about racial minorities, though that is a thing too, but people that are the minority opinion, perhaps when it comes to values. So since that's part of the role of government, they're also, also a balancing act there because if we let markets completely dictate it, the market might dictate that whatever the majority view is, is the right view. That makes sense? So, so anyway, and there's this balance. And really, I think that some of these other policies, industrial policies, mercantilist policies, Keynesian economics is really about trying to straddle these two extreme positions. Uh, completely centralized control of socialist or communist type economic system versus a complete free market system where you know the uh, invisible hand guides the transactions over time to encourage companies and people to make good decisions. Does that make sense? But I do think it's interesting and I, I think that there's a place for this in the discussion. So thank you. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so going back to the article, um, this was, I've alluded to this, but this idea that's drawn explicitly in the article that economic power and financial power, which in a way are very much kind of the same thing, can lead to your political and military power depending on how you choose to use your money. And, and, and political power is a function of a bunch of things. Those are all listed directly from the article. Um, we see that even in, even going back to the Russian Ukraine example, right? Um, geographies at play. <laughs> You know, that there's a, a big plain there. There's mountains to the south of Ukraine where that border is um, with Romania. Um, there's a mountain range that runs through there, but to the north, there's not much. And so Russia views Ukraine as something of a liability. Interestingly enough, you were talking about wheat earlier. I thought it was ironic you picked that. As I was driving in, I learned on the radio that um, Ukraine, I, I knew that Ukraine was called the breadbasket of Europe. 
you've probably heard that before um, from your history class, whatever that was. But Ukraine provides 50% of all the wheat used by the United Nations in all their programs. So there's a concern that as the war drags on, we're not really dragging on yet, but if, if it drags on, it could really disrupt wheat production. And that could really harm the ability of the United <coughs> Nations to feed people that are starving all over the world because half of their wheat comes from the Ukraine. So, so which actually leads into, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute, but, but so geography is an issue. The demographics are interesting. The fact that there are ethnic Russians living in the Ukraine as well as many ethnic Ukrainians. One of the things that Putin has tried to say is, well, we're really all Russian. And the Ukrainians are like, mm. yeah. I mean, even your point from earlier, your example of those grad students, you know, that's, that's not true. There's, there's divisions there. Um, the size of the economy makes a difference. Russia's economy is much larger than Ukraine's. Quality of leadership, quality of the military. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's really the open question. I think we have some notion of the quality of the Russian military. What we don't know much about is the quality of the Ukrainian military <coughs> right now and the social cohesion of the population. And that's always one of the really key things. The more democratic your society is, the more important the social cohesion matters. So if you're a student of history, you'll know that the United States entry into both World War I and World War II were very fraught. You know, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to enter the war in 1939. But the, the prevailing popular sentiment seems to have been the other direction. And so we did not. Exactly. Though, I mean, I don't want to talk about, I, I love history and military history actually as a hobby, but again, I'm not a professor of that. But, you know, we traded with England. We helped keep them afloat in the war. We basically forced Japan to do something. You know, Japan, if, as you know, had, had invaded China. They'd taken over a big chunk of China. They had ambitions in the area and their military was building up, but they had no source of oil. They got 90% of their oil from the United States to run their ships and their airplanes and their tanks and their cars and their industry. Well, we cut all that off, you know, in 1941, earlier in 1941. So they were just running on, on their reserves. And so they were forced to do something. What they chose to do was attack Pearl Harbor, which I think had the exact opposite impact of what they hoped rather than causing the American people to feel like they didn't want to get involved with kind of galvanized support for the war, both in Europe and in the Pacific theater. And that's kind of history, um, was something of a miscalculation probably. But the Japanese were responding to this pressure because they either had to stop, which is what the United States had hoped, or they had to find some other source. And so they chose to attack, which was an interesting choice. Um, but anyway, this social cohesion is an issue. I'm sure you've all seen reports that there are, you know, people in Russia who do not support the war. Um, the question is how many people and how much power and persuasion do they have in Russia? If there's enough, then maybe, maybe it changes things and probably not. <laughs> all right. So a couple of things related to this idea of power. One of the things economically going back to this idea of neoliberalism is this idea that absolute gains are more important than relative gains. Meaning if we all, as, as companies, as countries have more economic power, that's more important than how much more they have than others. Trade is good as long as both sides benefit and trade will happen. That's kind of a pillar. Um, but political realists is what the article labels these people believe that economic power is crucial to political and military power. So prosperity and wealth increases the military defensive capacity. So even though an action might be better for everybody, um, if, if it changes the relative power balance, then maybe, maybe we should do it. And that's, I think, what, what Pete was saying to some extent. Maybe it's challenging. Um, all right, and, and I thought this was a really interesting quote by President Biden in the article, and it was in one of the earlier slides. Um, Biden said, in today's world, economic security is national security to justify some of these policies he's trying to put into place. And I think there's some truth to that, but there's also, we have now a counterfactual that happened in the invasion of Ukraine, right? 
So essentially the argument is that the sanctions, the economic sanctions will keep Russia in check. And the threat of additional economic sanctions will keep them from perhaps actually invading. And uh, they didn't. So the so there is sometimes you don't just need economic security, you need security security. And, and I think we see that now, perhaps. Now, here's a picture, and, and I I didn't want to try to, I tried to, I, I, I found um, diagrams on websites that were easier to put into my slides than trying to pull from the article. But there's a picture in the article of the GDP in China, which is actually that blue line. And they, they undertook a lot of reforms at the beginning of 1976. And you can see what's happened to the gross domestic product of China over time. And they've used a lot of mercantilist or industrial policies in part to achieve that, that growth. Um, ones mentioned in the article included devalued currency, tax incentives, subsidies, low interest rates, and privileged access to resources. I've added a few others um, of my own. One of the areas that I do research in is in um, international trade and supply chains, sourcing, and the costs associated with sourcing. And so um, I've done work that looks at you know, trying to figure out what it actually costs to bring things in from China or from Mexico or from other countries in the United States. And, and as part of that, we came across these types of things, tight import controls, forced partnerships. One of the things that the Chinese government did was they, if a US company wants to come in and make something and sell it in China, they're not allowed to do that unless they partner with a local company which facilitates intellectual property sharing, we'll say. So you have to give your intellectual property to the company in China that you're partnered with. But because of the nature of the political system, if you share intellectual property with a company in China, who did you just share your intellectual property with? Chinese government. So the Chinese government essentially absorbed a ton of intellectual property relative to products, materials, and manufacturing processes as they foster their industrial um, policies. In a way, I mean, and this may be a stretch, and I look at Pete as I say this, but I, I think that there was a really unique environment for China at the time that they started these policies because they were so far behind in terms of technology and the intellectual property. Like, I don't think that we could replicate that because they're not light years ahead of us when it comes to technology, even if they allow us to, which they would not. But it was a situation where they were willing to do manufacturing cheaper than we could. They were willing to do it using practices that we didn't want to use anymore in some cases, lots of labor, and initially very lax environmental regulations and lax enforcement of regulations that existed. And in the meantime, they gained a lot of knowledge now they have the capacity and we're where we are today. The other thing that China does, and this was in one of the slides, is they were willing to essentially sacrifice short-term objectives like profitability uh, to grow an industry and volume. That's why you saw a lot of cries and complaints about them you know, dumping resources into the world markets at the low market values. Steel is a good example of that. And essentially, the, the argument was that they were subsidizing the steel industry so that they could just get it really big, so that they would have all this capacity and all this knowledge. Um, and in the meantime, they weren't worried about whether it was making money or not. And that meant that the Chinese steel companies forced other foreign steel companies out of business because you could get Chinese steel cheaper than you could get steel from United States or Canada or Japan or Germany or other big steel manufacturing locations. All right, and, and so that's kind of where we are. And, and this the argument now is, well, this has worked so well for China, these mercantilist or industrial policies, maybe we need to implement industrial policies of our own to uh, replicate the so-called success that, that China has had. It talks about the Made in China 2025 plan that was rolled out in 2015, specifically targeting these 10 um, industries. I, I Now, this is just me. Um, I went through and classified those four industries as being particularly important to defense, next generation information technology, aerospace, 
maritime equipment and high-end ships and new materials and processes. Um, if you expand that to consider which of these areas might actually indirectly feed your military complex, we add biopharma and uh, high-end computing. And then the other three really all have to do with infrastructure, um, which is interesting here. Now there's a section on definitions, which I don't want to spend a lot of time on because I want to get to other questions, but it talks about tactics for industrial policy and lists the main vertical industry policies. These are things that help specific companies and in specific industries, tariffs, import quotas, direct subsidies, domestic procurement requirements. So you say you have to buy so much of your product from a Chinese company or from a US company instead of buying it all from overseas, direct state investment and currency manipulation, keeping the value of your currency low vis-a-vis -vis other currencies so that you have a more favorable export environment, which is what China did for many years. Um, there's also horizontal industry policy instruments where they, they don't necessarily benefit a single industry or a single company. It uh, talks about increased spending on R&D by the government, um, strengthening education, worker training, improving infrastructure, flexible labor markets, working through public-private partnerships, investment through national development banks, and reduced corporate tax rates as policies that kind of generally try to help economic growth and are can be seen as mercantilist or <coughs> policies in a way. Um, all right, that's kind of where we're at with there. I, I threw a slide in for myself. This slide is about supply chain. Um, one of the things that's really happened, you know, COVID-19 has brought supply chains to the forefront. Now, for what I do for a living, this is great because, you know, three years ago, most people had, didn't even know what a supply chain was. Now everybody has a mental image of what a supply chain looks like, um, which I think is great. <laughs> but one of the things that's happened, this, this is my own classifications of the issues that have created <laughs> supply chain problems. Number one is really structural issues related to supply chains. And that is, as we've globalized, as these neoliberal economic policies have been implemented, not just by the United States, but by many countries that have facilitated international trade, we now have supply chains that are very complicated and complex. There, you know, we trade, you know, most of you probably drove here in a car of some flavor, and that car probably has parts in it from all over the world that were sourced from South Africa, that were sourced from South America, that are from Asia, um, Canada, Mexico, Europe, um, and the United States. And, you know, most, it doesn't even matter what brand it is. Most cars out there, whether they're a Japanese car or a US model or a made in Europe car, you know, an Audi or BMW or a Volvo or something, they all have parts from all over the world. And it's not just cars. Many products have parts from all over the world. So number one, uh, supply chains got really, really big, meaning they're, they're far flung. They use parts from all over the place where they can be made cheapest um, in many cases, um, but still at the quality we want. But that creates vulnerabilities, um, both in terms of transportation, as well as different bureaucracies. You know, crossing a border, even for a train, isn't always simple. And so the more borders you cross, the more you increase the complexity of the network. Number two, you have managerial things that we've done. Um, we've pursued economies of scale, which is reducing costs, essentially. Um, we've become hyper-efficient, really good at doing what we do, meaning small profit margins so that we can pass those benefits onto the consumers. But in the process of doing that, you, you sacrifice the potential for some flexibility. If I have a little extra capacity, then I've got a buffer, right? Like a little more than I need. So if I need to make a little more or transport a little more, I can do it, but I pay for that. So if I can figure out what capacity I have is extra and then shave it off, I'm saving costs that I can then pass on to the consumer. So in a way, our desire for inexpensive products to pay as little as possible to the best product we can at the lowest cost pushes companies to pursue efficiency. And it's efficient to not have a lot of extra capacity uh, that you don't need, but it reduces flexibility. Well, that's what's happened in supply chains for, for 
many years, they're seen as a cost center in the company and they focus on reducing costs and doing a great job at being efficient, which, which is great. However, it makes you more vulnerable to risks. And that's basically what's happened is that um, supply chains are very efficient. They can't add that capacity. You know, I decided to get rid of some capacity. So I sell a factory, I get rid of some workers. Just, I don't even maybe fire them. I just don't hire people that retire or that quit. Um, you know, I have my fleet of boats and had, you know, 20 big container ships, but I was only filling them about 80%. So I get rid of three ships. Well, anyone know the lead time on building a big container ship? You know, if you have the money, a couple of years, right? So you can't, you can't just flip a switch and then buy another ship. You know, if that ship is gone, was sunk to make an artificial reef or sold to other, some other country, you've got to build a new ship that takes a while. Um, you got rid of skilled workers, you have to find new workers and train them. So we can't just flip the capacity off and on. It's a lot quicker to get rid of capacity than it is to find new capacity. Um, and that's got all compound, <clears throat> compounded because let's say I need specialized machinery. Under the best of environments, the lead time on buying highly specialized machinery for say my assembly line or for some sort of chemical process, probably, you know, six to 18 months under the best of, of circumstances. But when you have shortages, it's all compounded because now they can't get the parts they need to make the machinery, right? There's something they can't get. And maybe those lead times stretch from maybe <laughs> six to 12 months, to 18 months, maybe now it's two, three, four years before you can get the parts you need to add the capacity. So that's another big problem. Um, those are kind of managerial issues that were pressed into the companies by shareholders and by consumers. And then you have situational issues related to the pandemic that really caused a big problem. So one was as we transitioned to staying at home, many of us from being out a lot, our demand patterns changed. So now we were buying less or little of some things that we were buying a lot before and other things were now in high demand. Well, because the supply chains were so optimized for what people were used to buying, they couldn't respond to the fluctuations in the demand very well. And so there were shortages of things that people were now using more of. On the other side, um, those things that people weren't buying, what happened was a lot of those companies got rid of their capacity. And then as things returned to normal, that capacity is now gone. And so there's shortages of those things that we were consuming less of during the pandemic. The classic example there is cars. So what happened with cars? People weren't driving, therefore they weren't buying cars. Therefore the, the automotive companies quit making cars. Therefore they canceled orders with their suppliers. And for the computer chips, what happened was that capacity to make those chips was snapped up by other industries. Uh, consumer electronics took off during the pandemic we're all sitting at home. Oh, I could use a new TV. Oh, I could use a new Roku device. Maybe an iPad would be nice to sit in my chair and read, or maybe I get a new phone. And all those things have computer chips. So the computer chips, the companies making computer chips didn't lose capacity. They just shifted from making chips for cars to making chips for other things. And then when they started making the cars again, the chip companies are already running at full capacity but now they're making things, chips for other, other things. And there's a whole layer there where actually automotive companies are using old chips because old chips have all been certified from a safety standpoint to use. Many of the chips in the car were on safety devices, airbags and, and um, collision avoidance systems and things like that, and they're older technologies. So now the automotive companies want the chip manufacturers to build new factories to make older technology chips because they've all been approved. And the chip companies are like, you know, if they all start making them at the same time, lead time on a chip factory, uh, under the best of circumstances, maybe 18 to, you know, 36 months, with the shortages maybe a little longer, well, who knows what's going on in three years? So I start making it now, and we all start making a chip factory. Three years from now, when they come online, there's a glut of chips, and that's not good either. Um, there's a company I talked about a lot in my class because my father used to do consulting for them, a company called Dot Technologies, which many of you have ever heard of. Why? Because it doesn't exist. They were the 
one of the world leaders in making clean rooms in the 80s and 90s for manufacturing microprocessors. They, they had about 30% or 40% of the world market in clean rooms. And what happened to them, they'd grown from a little tiny, they were a spinoff of the Dock Construction, which does still exist, construction company. Um, they'd grown from maybe a $10 million company to maybe a $120, $30, $40 million company in the 90s as they made clean rooms for manufacturing microprocessors for computers and phones and other things and memory. And then in um, 99 or 2000, the memory market collapsed in terms of the price for computer memory, which was great for people making computers and buying computers, really bad for companies making memory and companies supplying the companies that make memory. So their, their sales went from like 130 million in one year, the next year was like 11 million. And the year after that, it was like 3 million. And the year after that, they were out of business. So <laughs> there's a lot of things going on here. So one was these demand shocks. They really change things. And it takes a while to catch back up. Will they catch up? Yes, they will. Somebody's going to take the risk and build a factory. The automotive companies will go ahead and work with the US government to try to certify newer chips for safety factors in their cars. But that's going to take to maybe the next models before those roll out. So you know, models run for five to seven years, it might take a while for things to all catch all the way back up. Um, I actually am in the market for a couple of cars. I have, I have teenage drivers, um, so I hope it catches up quicker, but I'm not holding my breath. Um, anyway, and then there's also supply side shocks as workers don't work, as ports shut down. Um, you know, one of the real problems with COVID actually has been how, how it rolls around the world and surges in different places at different times. So, you know, things might be fine here in Ohio, in Wood County right now. They're actually kind of so-so, like a medium level county. You probably saw the change yesterday in uh, the CDC's mask guidance and we're a medium county. But they may be bad in, say, Cincinnati, or maybe they're bad in Chicago. So the fact that it's good here, but I'm buying things from Chicago means maybe I can't get them from Chicago or maybe things are good here, but they're bad in China. And so China has shut down the port, so I can't get the product I need. So there's that, there's also the labor shortages. I think that we're seeing now that a lot of, a lot of people that were maybe pondering retirement went ahead and retired. You know, People who are working into their mid to late 60s or early 70s, COVID hits and they, they say, yeah, yeah, I'm good. We'll just retire because they, they could retire, but they were choosing to work. And so a lot of people left the workforce and that's left labor shortages. Um, I think that's part of the reason why other, other things that have happened that you hear about on the news, you know, as schools and kindergartens have shut down, um, you know, younger families that maybe have both parents working just can't do it anymore, you know, and so one of them quits or maybe one of them looks for new work. And that also affects the labor market. And so we have these classic economic issues in terms of demand fluctuations um, and supply side fluctuations that have created many of these problems and shortages. So what to do? Well, the article sums up some things that uh, Biden has done. What's interesting here is that um, there seems to be some agreement between the Biden administration and the Trump administration, which sounds crazy for many reasons. But it, it's interesting when the Biden administration came in, they quickly tried to reverse many of the things that the Trump administration had done, right? To mm -hmm. switch things back. One thing they did not switch back were our policy toward China. Um, it's basically stayed kind of the same, I think much to the frustration of China. Um, so anyway, uh, these, this has led to a change in attitude toward industrial policy, maybe. And so that's what's happening now. We have these, these are generally things that the Biden administration wants. Um, this is from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is not passed yet. Um, but there's a lot of, and if you look at these priorities compared to China's Made in China 25, um, there's a lot of overlap. So they've targeted some similar areas. There's also provisions that look like industrial policy in some of the Build Back Better provisions they tried to pass. Um, the 
article specifically mentions these four areas, semiconductors, minerals, materials, pharmaceuticals, and batteries specifically. Anyway, I've gone way over what I intended to for discussion or for talking. So let's, let's talk about this. The first five discussion questions here were the ones that were included with the article. The second two or the six and seven were ones that I came up with on my own um, as I was preparing to industrial policies really work, which I think is an interesting question. And then if, even if they do work, are they worth the baggage? You know, trust of government, giving up control. Um, the Austrian economists would say we might make things worse. So that's where we're at. And, and I, don't, I don't know the answer to, to all of these questions. So go ahead, are there questions for me or for Pete, or do you just want to say something about the topic right here? Uh, you mentioned all the concepts of products, but what about the quality of products and the fact that we're making more and more products disposable? Uh, you can't fix a TV. Well, that's a really, really good, good question. Um, can, you, can you repeat that? Well, yeah, so his question was about quality. And he's saying, you know, we, we make things cheaper and it actually worked better in many cases. But they can't be repaired um, or fixed, and so when they they fail, just throw them away instead of fixing them. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's something I think about a lot. Um, I actually do some research related to reuse of products and recycling as part of what I do in supply chain, and I would really like to see a focus more on reusable products, things that can be um, easily disassembled and recycled or remanufactured for use, but. Um, that goes to, that goes to I mean this is a classic example of the free market problem, right? Would you like that? Would you like products that can be disassembled and reused and repaired? Yeah, I would too. But why aren't they out there? You know, how much? Here's the question: How much more would you be willing to pay for that product? Well, that's the point. I think that they make it so that when I when I'm done with it, I go and get a new one. I, more profitable. Uh, there, there's probably some of that calculus going on. I think you're right. Absolutely. He was saying that they make it so when it wears out, I have to replace it and buy another one. I think there's some truth to that. But there's also this problem. Even if that wasn't true, even if, even if I was running a company and I didn't want you to go buy a new product, I actually wanted you to repair the one you've got, um, you've got about three things happening. One, it's actually much more, it's a little more expensive to manufacture a product that's repairable. So, for instance, I'm making a plastic product um, like this, like my cell phone, you know, I'm making my cell phone. Well, it's a lot cheaper to use a plastic weld to put the body together and to put the components in. It, it, there's no parts, it's just a plastic weld. I fuse the plastic together. It's stronger and it's cheaper than putting in screws or some other type of fastener. Does that make sense? So I increase the complexity and the cost of the phone by making it serviceable and remanufacturable. That's number one. Number two goes back to my previous slide of labor. So if I make it repairable, somebody's got to repair it. And in the United States, there's a big labor shortage. There's particularly a shortage of, I'll call it skilled or semi-skilled labor that might be able to diagnose and repair a phone or a TV or something like that. So you do have, I think, I think what you pointed out that sometimes they want things to, to die so that I have to buy a new one. But it's also expensive, more expensive to make something that can be repaired. And then there's maybe going to be a shortage and a long line to repair things. I had a car die two weeks ago, my son was driving, um, and it really died. <laughs> it was a Volkswagen hybrid awesome car, but the transmission went out. Um, anyone know what the transmission costs in a Volkswagen hybrid? It was a, 19, it was a 2013 Jetta hybrid, so they don't make any more. Um, apparently $10,300 for a new transmission, and this is a car that's got 190,000 miles on it. So, and it has some other problems too. I was probably kind of 15 grand to repair a car that has, you know, 150,000 miles on it. The reason why I bring up this story though is because I took it in to the local Volkswagen dealer um, and they're like, yeah, we can diagnose that in about 10 days. I'm like, what? 10 days to hook it to your computer and tell me what's wrong with it? They're like, 
chip shortage. I'm like, chip shortage? What does that have to do with plugging my computer up to your computer and telling me what's wrong with my car? He said, well, chip shortage has led to an increase in new car prices, about 10, 15%, which has led to an increase in used car prices, around 40%, which has led to many people choosing to repair cars that they maybe would have got rid of before. Meaning our lead time went from one or two, one to three days, which isn't awesome, but that was kind of unusual. That, that isn't bad for dealership, he said. Until about three, four months ago, it got to about 10 days lead time you look at a car, and it's been hovering about 10 days ever since. So again, if I make products that can be repaired, you know, I've got to sell them for say maybe 5% more, 10% more, 15% more, let's say. And then when it comes time to repair it, some people don't care and are going to try. And then if they do try, they might be without their product for a week, two weeks, a month, six weeks. So yeah, I would love to see us move that direction personally. I'm just explaining that there are a lot of problems with it. And I think there are good reasons why companies don't do it. Not maybe not good reasons, but logical reasons beyond just trying to make more money. Does that make sense? I don't think every company is just trying to suck as much money out of the marketplace as it can. Some are. But, but even companies that want to be more, I would say, responsible um, producers of goods are facing these barriers and these obstacles to doing it. You know, I didn't really go into it. You know, my background is manufacturing engineering, so I do know products. There was a hand over here. Yes. Good question, by the way. And probably too long an answer. <laughs> I get involved uh, in supply chain. My daughter involved in the supply end of Marathon. My son graduated from BTSU with with the corporation in supply chain, and he's still with another company. They dealt a lot with China. This talking to him is China thinks we they got us over a barrel. And he used transmissions as an example. He goes like a thousand different parts in a transmission. They all come in from different parts of the world. They're made in I think Vietnam at that time. He says, if I build that transmission in the United States, it'll be almost ten to twelve thousand dollars more. Americans like cheap goods. We go to Walmart. Yeah. And to build all these goods in the U.S. to raise the prices so high. Correct. He said the price of a car, if we built that entire transmission in the United States, would raise about twelve thousand dollars. I get in. Would you agree with that? Um, I I don't know about the actual number that he said. Um, but it would increase the cost, yes. Uh, kind of. So, so there's an interesting, there's an interesting nuance here that unfortunately I do know something about, so therefore I will talk about it. Um, <laughs> when, when companies chose to move a lot of their production to China and to other Asian countries, really starting in the 80s, you know, this international trade really was kicked off by the invention of the containers, you know, so that they could move goods and not load them and unload them all the time. And uh, I think containers started being used in the late 50s. Does that sound right? I think it's late 50s. Um, but it took a while for everyone to see the, the opportunities. But by the 80s, those opportunities started to be well understood. And the prevailing economic theory, neoliberalism, was the order of the day. And, um, and then in 89, the Berlin Wall came down. And, all of a sudden the world didn't look nearly as scary as it had for most of our lives, right? And so we started trading with everyone. Um, basically, I think that a lot of the, the decision looked like this. Labor is very expensive in the United States. We can do it much, much cheaper, 90% cheaper for labor, perhaps in China. Um, transportation costs are not that high. We have container ships, we have ports, um, and look at all the people in China that we can maybe sell to. Let's move this production to China, and many companies did. And um, I think that there were two gross miscalculations, though. Three, I'll say three. Number one, very few U.S. companies are selling anything in China because they've you know, they use mercantilist policies to lock up the marketplace, number one. Number two, um, the intellectual property was all shared with China. 
at that time. And then number three, I think that many companies underestimated the risks and the costs of doing business so far away. And there's a lot of intangible costs, things like, you know, flying your executives over to visit the company or your engineers or your quality personnel, um, hiring translators because they may not speak Chinese or Japanese or Vietnamese. Um, you know, you're probably aware of this, but the cost of moving a, a 40 foot container, which is the standard container size now from, from China to the United States was hovering about three thirty-five hundred dollars, maybe four thousand dollars. If you're lucky, maybe you get a low three. But we'll say twenty-eight hundred to maybe five thousand dollars for quite a while. That had been the price. Does anyone know what it costs now? Thirty on the yeah thirty thirty is a good guess. It's that's really high, but it's really in that twenty to thirty thousand dollar range this year. Up to thirty thousand dollars, maybe if you're lucky, you're getting for twenty one, twenty two. That's a huge logistics cost increase, you know, that you have to absorb or pass on or something. Um, and so, these risks associated with now being kind of, you know, um, in the meantime, Maersk, the biggest uh, maritime company, Danish company, you know, record profits, right? You know. Um, this happens whenever the price of oil fluctuates too, or up to hundred dollars a barrel. You know, oil companies are not doing very well if it stays up there. In fact, the war in Ukraine is good for oil companies because it's going to lead to increased demand for oil and higher prices and higher profits. So anyway, um, I don't know about the about the actual number. Ten thousand sounds like it's in the ballpark. It sounds high to me personally, um, but I because I think that sometimes these these coordination costs are underestimated that you actually reduce if you move production back to the United States or to Canada or Mexico, it will be easier, if that makes sense. But I'm sure that it would go up. So whether it goes up by $5,000 or $10,000, you know, I don't know. We were talking about the, like, the goods in Walmart. Yeah. They would probably go up. The price of almost everything goes up if you move it back, but not but not necessarily. That's, that's where it gets interesting. Um, <clears throat> because of the coordination costs and the risks that I've been talking about, um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I, you know, I actually published a paper um, in the International Journal of Production Economics in 2013 with some co-authors where we took a look at these location decisions. And the paper only looks at making goods in Mexico versus the United States, but the paper actually shows that for some goods, you're better off making domestically. So. So the answer is it depends. Well, the company works for now has its own plant and almost all suppliers. <clears throat> yeah. It's a lot easier for it's a lot easier to coordinate. And so that's the thing is the question is, are the coordination costs savings significantly great to make up for the much higher labor and regulatory costs potentially? And sometimes they are. Like it really depends. I do think though that. You know, automotive is a particular industry where there's been a lot of competition from Japanese companies and European companies and American companies. And so they've really, really squeezed on costs and tried to make things as efficient as possible, which means if they're making it in, in China, they're making it there because it's probably cheaper. And so I do think that for automotive, you're always going to see a price increase, cost increase, and therefore a price increase when you bring production back domestically because they're so focused on it. That if it wasn't if it wasn't cheaper, they wouldn't be there. They aren't going to be back. Does that make sense? But I think that there are some products, and I don't know the line that your son's working for now, but there are some products where that's not true. They haven't made the, the supply chain so efficient and squeezed all the cost out to where what they're doing is really the best practice. So I think there's many things that could come back that won't go up by much in price. And it's maybe good to figure out what those things are. The other thing is that a lot of companies are looking now to reshore because it's such a headache. Dealing with things during the pandemic. Yeah. As you're talking about China, as the country there lets people move up in world status and economic status, that makes cost over there a lot more expensive. And uh, we had a chance.
groceries, I labor content. Um, textiles come to mind. The question, I didn't repeat the question. The question was, you know, there was movement of some um, production from countries like China to countries like Vietnam as the labor costs increased in China. And it, and it did. You know, labor costs, when we started moving to China in the 90s, were less than 10% of the labor costs here. I think labor costs in China now are more like 25% or 30% of the labor costs here based on my latest numbers that I remember. I'm going from memory, so take that with a grain of salt. But, but yeah, a lot of things like, like I always follow textiles. Textiles, garments, you know, they have a really high labor content usually as they're sewn and sometimes as they're cut out. And so that production tends to take place in really low labor cost environments. And so a lot of it shifted 20 years ago to Vietnam, to Thailand, to Laos, Cambodia, actually. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't keep like a close finger on the pulse. So I don't know if Vietnam is still much cheaper than China. I don't think so. I think that the, the cost of labor has increased in Vietnam and those textile manufacturers are looking for new places. I think you're seeing some movement toward the Middle East and you're seeing some movement to Africa where they can do it into India with textile manufacturing because the labor costs are lower. So they, they're quicker to follow the labor costs. Whereas back to the quality thing, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's happened is that the quality from China has gotten much better over the years. Um, still uneven, I think, compared to the US, but you can buy poorly manufactured goods that the US made too. Um, and so China, The standard of living has raised dramatically in China. Even, even some of the personal liberties and freedoms have increased a little bit in China over the past 20 or 30 years. And um, I think the same thing is true in Vietnam. You know, the cost of the standard of living has raised. Um, I think there are some more freedoms than there were 20 years ago. Um, but it's gradual and it's slow, and there's still the whole government piece, right? So, yeah, good question, though. Um, back here. Um, we're using economic sanctions to try to force Russia out of wants and with the international community, you know, what does China do? You know, um, I don't want to, well, I actually don't mind calling out China a little bit, but, you know, I think China could end it right now. Yeah, if China, if China came down on them, I think. And I think that would end the war pretty quickly. And if I could just yeah. Um, absolutely. So I think that the witch. Oh, yeah. 
So the question was about sanctions, and I think, um, yeah, the initial sanctions were good, but we haven't um, lowered the big boom. It's a banking uh, system, system. It's a banking system. system. Yeah. and that would essentially uh, make it impossible for to for them to make money off the gas, but also to use the big reserves. Yeah, have. yeah. And the problem is, is that that's such a dramatic uh, action. They would perceive that as a dramatic action, and they might escalate either with. Minor, they've been directed towards the oligarchs so far, right? The, the other thing I'll say about that is that because I agree with everything he just said. Back to the microphone. Oh yeah. Well, I don't have to leave though either. <laughs> say stay up here. Um, so the the, uh, the other thing about that though is that the United States doesn't have complete control. We're not buying. I don't think we're buying anyone from Russia directly, right? Maybe a little on the West Coast. Okay, so we buy a little, but. You know, we need cooperation from our trading partners, and they sell a lot to Europe. And same thing with SWIFT. You know, the United States, I don't think, can just switch the thought for them. That would require coordination, collaboration with a lot of European countries. And so while I think we might be there, maybe, politically, I'm not sure that other countries are. I, I don't know if you know that the United States forced a vote in the Security Council of the resolution yesterday sanctioning Russia. It failed because Russia has a seat on the Security Council. In fact, they have the presidency of the Security Council. But it was 11 votes for the resolution the United States introduced, one against, and three abstentions. And the three abstentions are what's really interesting. You can probably guess one of them. China. The other two were India and the United Arab Emirates. So the other 11 countries that I can't name um, all, voted, all voted for the the censure of, of Ukraine. So it's it's an interesting process, but when it comes to something like SWIFT, you might need to get the check. I'm sorry, you, I was muted. Is there any questions from anybody online today? <laughs> any questions? I think he has a question, but let's take this question over here while we wait. For I'll that. unmute them. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'm on Because everyone's saying, you know, don't try to have the government out of us, you know, let the market control. We know a free market sometimes is very skewed, 